The investment demand curve is going to be real easy. And my guess would be that you're not going to have to draw it, but you may have a question dealing with this. The one important thing to keep in mind is the relationship between the interest rate or the rate of return and the amount of investment is going to be an inverse relationship with downward sloping demand. That's really the only thing that we need to do with this. One of the curves that I left out of that list that we started with, if you've been you know, subscribing to these videos and paying attention, was the consumption function. And I want to make sure we go back and hit this one. With the consumption function, what you want to do is have consumption on the vertical axis. You want disposable income on the horizontal axis because disposable income is what you have left over after taxes. That's the money that you have that you can play around with a little bit. Now, in order to really get an understanding of where we are with the consumption function, you graph it against a 45 degree line. This is not the only one that we want to do this way, but it's the easiest one. So let's see. I think he's close. All right. So your 45 degree line is your reference line. When you put the consumption function on this graph, what happens is that even when disposable income is at zero, you're going to have some consumption. Because even when you're not making any money, it still costs money to live. So you don't want to start your consumption function at the origin because that's just not realistic. Now, this area, this distance, represents the amount of money that you're spending when you have no income. This area right here, where consumption is greater than your 45 degree line, means that you are spending more than you have. The 45 degree line means that you have a one-to-one -one relationship. It means that you're spending each dollar that you make without varying. You're breaking even all the time on that reference line. But that's not realistic. That's not how people live. So what tends to happen is that when your income is very low, you incur debt. That's what this area represents. And you can see that because the consumption line is higher vertically than the reference line. You get to a point, as your income is increasing, when you break even. When the consumption function crosses that 45 degree line, so that your consumption equals your income, that's your break even. means you are neither saving nor, nor going into debt. And as you cross that line, so that your consumption line is below your 45 degree line, this area represents the amount of savings. Another name for debt is dis savings. You might see that in a problem, it's just another name for the same thing. So when you are neither saving nor losing money, you're breaking even. That's the consumption function. Now the way we get from the consumption function to the aggregate expenditures function is just that we take C and we add the other GDP components to it. Building on the consumption function, another graph that you want to make sure you understand is aggregate expenditures. This is another one that's not difficult, but you have to take it in pieces to understand how the parts fit together. So, just like with the consumption function, we're going to have, this time, aggregate expenditures, which is all of the spending for the economy, using those components of your GDP equation. And we're going to put real GDP on the bottom. So, if you want to think of it this way, national expenditures and national income versus your spending and your disposable income, it's really the same thing on a much bigger scale. It's not going to be different. 
So the next thing that we want to put in here is your 45 degree reference line. He's a little steep, but I think you'll get the idea. Try to get it as close to 45 degrees as you can. Now, when we draw the aggregate expenditures function, remember again that we are including all those components of GDP, consumption, investment, government, and net exports. Now, the point where these two cross is going to represent your full employment output. expenditures is too low if it slides down below this level. So that we have this vertical difference here. If aggregate expenditures is too low, that is a recessionary gap. Because what happens is spending is not high enough to keep that full employment level. What happens if it's too high? So that now we're pushing beyond the full employment GDP, which means at this point, we're probably overutilizing our resources. We're probably paying our workers more than is really justifiable based on how productive they are. It's not good. We're driving prices up without really getting any more stuff. So what's going to happen is the inflationary gap. With the recessionary gap, too low with the inflationary gap, you're too high. And you would want to try to adjust with government policies to bring those things back into line. 